would, would you turn in your Bibles in the New Testament uh, to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, it's in the New Testament. I'm going to try to take 30 minutes here and I'm going to try to preach a message and, and uh, I uh, think it's something that God gave me. Um, God gave me this on Tuesday and um, I've been uh, struggling with it all week. Not struggling, I just... Uh, when I got on the subject, there's so many scriptures that I could use, and I know I've only got a short time, and I've got to, I've got to put everything in the truck, and I've got to get it out to you as soon as possible. But I've also only got a short time to get it to you. But um, if the spirit spirit allows it, I just pray that, that this will be a blessing to you. If you would, would you please stand in honor to reading God's word, Matthew chapter 11, Matthew chapter 11. Verse 1 through 13, Matthew chapter 11, verse 1 through 13. And it came to pass when Jesus has made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed thence to teach and preach in their cities. Now, when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples. Now, why was John in prison? Did John do something bad? Did John do something wrong? John wasn't in prison because he did something wrong. John was in prison because he did something right. Okay? Uh, a lot of people, they got this mentality that, you know, if I do everything right, nothing's going to happen to me. If I do everything right, I'll be fine. John was here, and he was doing something right. He decided to stand up to Herod. He decided that he's going to tell Herod, Herod, you're doing wrong. You're living in sin. You're not doing the right thing. And because of that, he got thrown into prison. He got thrown into prison for taking his finger and sticking it in Herod's face and calling him out on his sin. All these preachers, all these so-called Jewish people that knew the Bible, knew the Scriptures, not a one of them could stand up to Herod. They just let him get away with whatever he wanted because they didn't have no backbone. Now, look at verse number 3. And said unto him, Art thou that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went ye out to the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out to, for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom I whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Verily I say unto you, Among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. Until John. This is what we considered all the others had prophesied to Jesus. But John, he was the forerunner. That's what they say, until John. John was the forerunner. He, he actually, he's the one that told him Jesus was coming. He's actually the one that baptized Jesus. He was the forerunner of Jesus Christ. And that's why he's the greatest of them all. Because he actually got to see Christ. He actually got to be with Christ. He actually got to baptize him. He's the greatest one at all. And it talks about him being a reed shaken with the wind. Uh, uh, he, he's not moved by the wind. He's not moved by change. He's not moved. He's steadfast. He sticks with the stuff. He stays. He doesn't let opinion sway him. He lets the book sway him. He lets the book mold him and make him how it should be. And hopefully we can all be that way. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity, Lord. And Lord, I just pray this morning that you would get me out of the way once again. And uh, you would allow the Holy Spirit to work. Dear God, I know that there's a ton of people here this morning. And I can count 25 of them on my hand that are going through something right now. And dear God, I want to help them. And then I got the other people, Lord, in the crowd that they're going, everything's going good. But I can see storms ahead, God. And I'm, I just want you to help them. And I, I pray that if maybe if they're not going through the storm this morning, I just pray that in a, in, when they do go through the storm, because the storms always come, when they do go through the storm, Lord, I pray that they will remember my words. I will pray that they will remember your words in this Bible. And I will, maybe, I will just pray that they will get a, a Bible truth that they can lean on 
And I'm not saying that it's going to be easy to go through things. And I'm not saying that they should just straighten up and quit acting the way they're acting. But I just want to give them something that will keep them going. Just give them a little bit of hope. Just give them a little bit of something they can grab onto and they can squeeze and, and take a hold of and that will help them. And God, that's truly what I want to do this morning. That's my heart. And I'm just, help, I'm just begging you, God, please, just you know, you know what you're dealing with this morning. You know what kind of preacher you got in your hand right now. And I'm just asking you to use me, please, in your precious holy name. Amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> here, you have, uh, here you have John, and uh, clearly the Scripture, keep your Bible open this morning, but uh, clearly in the Scripture, here you have John, and he's sitting in prison. He's sitting in prison. He's sitting in his jail cell. Now, prisons back in Bible days, they, it wasn't three hots in a cot. It was a, a, a bowl of slop and a, and, a, and a stone for your pillow, okay? They didn't have HVAC. They didn't have, if the roof leaked, big deal. You were in prison. So what if you got wet? So what if you were hungry? Are you cold? We don't care about you. It was different than it is today. Now, prisons are horrible today. I'm not saying I want to go, and I'm not saying you want to go. They're a bad place you don't want to be in. But here's John. He's sitting in prison, and he asks this question. He says, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Now, he says, are, we, are, thou, are thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Now, that's an interesting question coming from a man like John. Here is John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus Christ. He's the, he's the one that baptized Jesus. He's the one that heard God speak and talk about his son. He said, behold, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Here we have him, and he's the one that heard all this. He's the one that's seen all this, and here he is in prison. And he's in prison, and his faith is shaken a little bit in his God, and he's worried about what's going on in his life. And he asks this question. He says, he says, Are thou he that should come, or do we look for another? I want to preach to you this morning when your world doesn't make sense. Now listen, we're all going to go through a time when our world's not going to make sense. I've had it happen several times in my life, and I've had it happen uh, numerous times in friends' lives, and I've seen people go through things that their, their life doesn't make sense. And I want to preach to you on that topic this morning. I want to preach to you on what the Bible says about what we should do when our life doesn't make sense. And I want to try to show you that you're not alone. And I want to try to show you that God still loves you. He still hears you. Even though your life doesn't make sense, He still loves you. When we were going to uh, uh, our, our other church that we went to for about 20, 22 years, uh, we got to know a family. And this family, uh, had a, there was a husband and a wife, and they had about eight children. Now, the husband's name was Harold. Harold Sims. He was a black man. His wife was a black woman. And Rosalind Sims. They had eight children. They were a good, godly family. Uh, they served the Lord. They prayed. Uh, Brother Harold, he was, a, he was a fireman for the city of Toledo. He's, uh, he's still there, actually, to this day. Uh, uh, been his whole life, been a fireman. Always preaching the gospel to them firemen. Always witnessing to them. Always telling them about how, how hot the fires of hell would be because he'd use, use, you, he'd use you know, fire because that's what they deal with. And he'd use that to witness to them and evangelize to them. And numerous uh, firemen have trusted Christ their Savior because of Brother Harold. But, but Brother Harold, and Miss Rosalind, they had they had all these children, and at the end of their pre, uh, the last the last set of children that they had, they had twins. They had two little twins, and I think the twins were about three months old. And they 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 came home from the hospital, and she'd had them, and and she was good at taking care of kids, and she just had a spirit about her that was unbelievable. I mean, the ladies literally, her, her, you never saw her dander get up. You never saw her get excited. I think it was from having all these kids and seeing them all tumble and get hurt and all these different things. She just had a calmness about her, and you knew everything was going to be okay. Well, Rosalind Sims, while she was sitting at home one day, uh, it was three months after, after the babies had been born, uh, little beknownst to us that when you have so many children and you have a, a lot of children, uh, you can get a, 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 a thing that, that happens, a situation in your heart where your heart gets enlarged. And her heart became enlarged. And she didn't feel bad. She didn't feel uh, like there was any problems. But her heart became enlarged. Long story short, she passed away. She died right there at home. She died in the rocking chair. She died while all the kids were home. And, and uh, she died and the babies were home, no doubt. And here you see this family. You see this good, godly family that's out serving God. And they're out, they're out soul winning. And they're out they're bringing their kids. I remember they'd bring them, bring them all Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. They were very faithful. He was always trying to help out in the church, Brother Harold was. But you look at that and you go, that makes no sense, preacher. That makes no sense how a family like that can go through something like that. That 
makes no sense that God would take that mommy from all them kids. All those kids have to grow up without a mommy. Only their dad's going to raise them. Preacher, that makes no sense. Why would this happen to a good family like this that was so faithful? Why would it happen to a guy that goes out on visitation, to a guy that preaches to his friends? And, and the guy, I, I hope to have Brother Harold here someday. I, I've called him and asked him to come visit sometimes. And, and I, if you, the guy's just... His spirit about him is just so sweet and it's so precious. And I've never, I've really never heard him say an ill word. Honestly, there, there's people like that. You've never heard him say an ill word towards anyone. I mean, you could literally make him mad as fire, and he won't say an ill word. He just stay calm and he loves people. How, how could something like that happen? How could something like that happen, preacher, to a family like that? Bad things are supposed to happen to bad people, right? That's what we're taught. If you're bad, bad things happen to you. If you do wrong, bad things happen to you. That's what's supposed to happen. Good things are supposed to happen to good people that do right things for God. People that love God. I see people all the time, they just get saved. They just start getting in church. And things happen to them. And you're like, man, preacher, that don't make no sense. It doesn't make any sense to me sometimes. Good thing, good, good, good people that are doing what they're supposed to do. And something bad will happen to them. And something terrible, horrible will happen to them. I'm like, man, that doesn't make any sense. Sense. What happens when your life doesn't make sense? I remember also we had, a, we had a family in our church that we went to church with and we actually went down to their house and we visited them in Georgia and we stayed with them. And I can still remember the phone call. Uh, uh, it, it was Jim and Sharon Milton. And Brother Jim, he woke me up at 4 in the morning and, and he, he was telling me that, that Sharon and this little girl, his daughter Kendra, I think she was 8 years old, uh, had her in junior church. And me and Miss Tina, we just fell in love with her. And, and him, her and Miss, Miss Sharon were out driving on a divided lane highway on a 4 lane and, and I think a truck they, they, they got they pulled in front of a truck and a truck hit them and when it hit them it, it pushed them into the median and the car immediately went into the medium and burst into flames and they both died right there on the highway and I think, man, that family, how could something happen like that to that family? Jim and Sharon, two, two, two husband and wife that love one another. They're serving the Lord. They're saved. They're, they're trying to do the right thing. And I'm not saying that, that, that they, they weren't not perfect. I mean, people are just trying. I'm talking good people that are just trying to do the right thing. And God allows something like this to happen. Something like this goes on. How can it that, that, that God would do this? You're supposed to, um, they did right. They feared the Lord. That's not supposed to happen. This ain't the way it's supposed to happen. This ain't the way it's supposed to go down. They loved God. They, they served God. They prayed to God. They talked to God. God's supposed to curse the people that hate Him, curse the people that don't love Him, and things like that. Why is it that good people have to suffer and bad people seem like they can go on through life without getting a scratch? They go on life and nothing hurts them. Nothing bothers them. Well, why is it that it always seems like the good people are the ones that are getting hurt? The good people are the ones that are getting crushed. Now, if you live long enough, you're going to experience, just like John did, in this Bible passage, you're going to experience interrupted faith. Your faith is going to be interrupted someday in life. Maybe it's being interrupted right now. Maybe you're crying out to God and you're like, God, are you hearing me? God, can you hear what I'm saying? I'm talking to you, God. Please answer my prayers. I'm coming to church. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I talk to you. I pray. I, I, I'm begging you to help me out. And there's going to come a time in your life where you're going to go and you're going to have interrupted faith, where your faith's going to be interrupted and you're not going to be able to figure out what's going on. You're not going to be figure out what nothing's going to make sense to you. You'll experience the times of your life when nothing seems to make sense. And there's no rhyme or reason. There's no plan or purpose. Now here's John the Baptist sitting in jail. And Jesus said with his own lips, it said in verse number 11, he says, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Jesus said that with his own lips. It's in the red. That's what he said about John the Baptist. He said, this man, there was none like him born of a woman. This man was faithful. This man was solid. This man was a rock. And here he is sitting in jail, and things are not starting to make sense to him. Things are starting to kind of unravel in his life. He can't figure out why he's going through this, why he's ha all these things are happening. John was the forerunner of Christ. Malachi chapter 3 said that he would come. Elizabeth and Mary, they were pregnant at the same time. Elizabeth was John's mom. Mary was Jesus' mom. They were cousins. They were uh, pregnant at the same time. It was a special time. He was his blood cousin. John said, Behold the Lamb of God. John was the one that baptized Jesus. The same man that baptized Jesus. And here he is, sitting in jail, going through something in his life, and he's saying, Is this the one that, we, that should come, or do we look for another? Are you really who you say you are, or should we go find somebody else? That's what he's saying. John said, Behold the Lamb of God. 
Now, John heard God's voice talk about his son. Now John's sitting in prison, and reality begins to set in. This is when the bad stuff happens. This is when the hard times happen. Everybody's good when you're on top side. Everybody's good when the sun's shining. Everybody's good when there's no rain. That's when you make it. That's when you're fine. You're, hey, preacher, I'm good. Everything's okay. But now John's sitting in prison, and reality begins to set in. Prison was hard, and nobody was coming to his rescue. It finally sat in that, hey, nobody's coming for me. I, I, nobody's coming to get me. Nobody's coming to visit me. Nobody cares about me. Nobody loves me. Here I am, I'm out here doing God's work, doing God's will, preaching the gospel, stuck my finger in the face of Herod, telling the truth, sticking with the stuff, doing what I'm supposed to do, and nobody's coming back for me. It's easy for us to criticize Bible characters. We do it all the time. We look at Peter when he stepped out on the boat, and this is what we say. Well, he just took his eyes off Jesus. That's why he fell in the water. That's why he wasn't unable to walk on water. You know what? We don't know what we would do if we were there. We have no idea. I think I'd be one of the guys that stayed in the boat. I think I would. I, I can guarantee you, I can prove that throughout my life, that God's given me things to do, and there's things where I stayed in the boat, and I hid, and I cowered, and I didn't listen to His call. So it's easy for us to sit here and critique people in the Bible. I took His eyes off God. Ah, oh, there He is sitting in prison, feeling sorry for Himself. I'm telling you, we don't know, because we don't know what we would do. And you better be careful what you say, and you better be careful what you think. But here John is sitting in prison, and reality sitting in, when what's going on in his life, and there's nothing harder to deal with in life than facing the reality of a terrible tragic situation okay a lot of times we, we 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 respond to bad news in two different ways okay first thing we do is we get optimistic we'll say ah it's not that bad it's not as bad as it looks maybe we'll make it through this i think we can get through this yeah this is a little hiccup yeah i just tripped yeah i bumped my toe but maybe we can get through this we have a little optimism then we have unbelief we're like, I can't believe this has happened to me. I can't believe this is happening to my family. I can't believe that my child is the one that did this. I can't believe that this is that, that, that my dad is the one that's sick. I can't believe that my child is the one that, that has, a, has, a, has a problem with their body and now they have leukemia. That's what we do. We sit there and we're like, I cannot believe this. We have disbelief and then we have optimism. Even in marriage, we'll, for, for, for a little while, like well, if, if you go through marriage counseling and you come to the pastor's office and maybe there was a little infidelity or maybe there was some cheating or something like that, and, and you go there, and when the first time in the office, you're like, hey, I think we can make it. I think we've talked to the pastor. I, I think we can make it. And then a week goes by. And then two weeks go by. And then three weeks go by. And then reality sits in. And that old devil, he'll get on your shoulder. And then he'll tell you things and make you think things. And then reality sits in. Reality sets in in a change of health. Maybe you're adjusting to diabetes. Maybe you're adjusting to heart problems. Maybe you're adjusting, you're having to adjust your diet so you can make it on different ways, on different things. Maybe your body's not what it used to be and you're seeing that. And you're having to adjust to those things. Maybe those things that you're going through. It's very hard to deal with reality of a bad situation. Okay, it's very hard to do that, even with health issues, especially when it's life-altering or life-changing. It's hard to deal with those issues. Now, John the Baptist began to realize what's going on in his life. His prayers don't seem like they're being answered. He's here and he's looking and he's like, man, uh, I, I, I don't know what John was thinking. I wasn't there. But if I was John, here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking this. I'm thinking, man, God, I served you. Man, God, I brought my kids to church. I've listened to your word. Man, God, I've even preached your book. I've even taught your Bible. I've taught in your Sunday school. I've been, I've been faithful. I've been trying. And here you are, God. You're not hearing me. There's people over there, God, that you're... And, 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 and Jesus told them the answer. Jesus said He's healing the blind. He's healing the sick. And, and there were many people that Jesus would, would heal them the day that He met them. Like their life would change the day that He met them. He met those blind people. They didn't know Jesus. They didn't have no time with Jesus. They didn't even heard of Jesus. And the first time they saw Him, the first time they met Him, that's when they got saved. That's when their life was changed. That's when they were healed and made to walk. And here's John. He's been with Jesus. He's got seniority. He's had time with Him. They got history together. And here's John. He's in prison. And he's thinking, man, I got history. And there you are over there helping those people. They don't even know you. They've never even heard of you. And you're over there helping them. And here I am sitting alone. Here I am by myself. I was doing everything right. And you ain't even coming to see me. And you ain't even coming to help me. What is wrong with this? And his foundations begin to crack. And he began to think, man, are you really who you say you are? And that's when he sent them two disciples. That's when he did. He said, are you really who you say you are? Or should we look for another? 
Are you really Jesus? Are you the one? Because I'm thinking I should look for another. And that same day, he changed those other people's life. And that's what he was thinking. He was talking to them, and John's in prison. And, he re- and you know what? Not one time did Jesus reach out to John in prison. He didn't write him a letter. He didn't call him. He didn't come see him. He didn't do anything. You know why? It wasn't in his plan. It wasn't in his plan to get him out of prison. It never, ever was in his plan. And John started realizing that. And that's when reality set in. And that's when his foundation got sh- shaken. And that's when his foundation started crumbling. And that's when he had interrupted faith. And that's what, that's what I'm telling you. Why? Because it was never his plan. Then something darker happened. Even darker. I had this happen in my life. Actually, one time in my life. And I can remember it. And I can remember it vividly. You get this... You, get this, uh, you think, you know... You start not believing in religion. And then you start not believing in people. And then you lose your faith in the whole world. You start losing your faith. But there'll come a time, if you're not careful, where it happened to me for about 15 seconds and I snapped out of it. Where I looked at my wife and kids and I thought, man, for 20 years I've been bringing these kids to church. For 20 years I've been telling them this Bible is true. For 20 years I've been coming to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, paying 10% of my income like the Bible teaches. I've been giving the missions. I've been, I've, been, I've been back in the preacher. I've been back in the church. And for a split second, for 15 milliseconds, I said, man, is God really real? Is this really Him? Jesus, are you real? Or have I been dragging my family through the mud like some kind of nutcase? Have I been doing something that I shouldn't have been doing? Have I been duped? Are you really who you say you are? And then right away you stand down and you say, yes, I am. You remember. You remember when I talked to you. You remember what you felt. You've had times in your life where I've taken yeah. care of you, where I've, where I've made a way where you could be taken care of. And that split second, I snapped out of it, and I got out of that dark place. But I'm telling you right now, that's where John's at. He's in that dark place where he doesn't even believe in God. He doesn't even believe that Jesus is real. And here he, I haven't even seen Jesus in person. He's seen Him in person. He's seen Him go through all these things. And here he is. His faith is shaken, and he can't believe. And he's looking for another. And that's that darker size. John thinks, what if? He says, what if he's not who he says he is? What if all I've done was in vain? Then he sends the two disciples and he said, Are thou he that should come or do we look for another? Wow, you talk about interrupted faith. Now I want to ask you a few questions. And probably at first this isn't going to help you. But when we get towards the end, it will help you. You're going to be like, man, preacher, this ain't helping at all. First question I want to ask you. What if God's plan is the opposite of what you're praying for right now? What if God's plan is the opposite of what you're praying for right now? Have you ever thought of that? What are you going to do? What are you going to do if he's got the plan and his plan is the opposite? I'm asking you, what if it's God's plan to take the biggest prayer request that's on your heart and your mind, and what if God's prayer request, he answers it in a way that's totally different than what you've been praying for? What if he asks you and answers in a way that's totally different than what you were expecting? What are you going to do? That's what I want to ask you. Now, faith, people think this. The charismatic crowd, they think that faith is the ability to manipulate God. If I have a lot of faith and I have all this faith, then God can use it and I can tell God how much faith I got and God will move mountains and God will make me prosperous and God will do all this stuff. Now listen, don't, I want you to get my point. God answers prayer, okay? I I can give you, I can sit around, I can take the mic down and I can give each one of you, I can say, tell me a time God heard your prayer and answered your prayer. And not one of you could say that he hasn't, Okay. But I'm not saying that. He does answer prayer. He does bless faithfulness. I'm telling you, when you're faithful in your tithes and offerings, when you're faithful in coming to church, He will bless you. We can't even see the things that He's shielded us from. And we think we're going through something and we think it's horrible. But there's other things that He may have even shielded us from that He's so merciful. But what I'm trying to tell you, we think that faith is the ability to manipulate God. We've bought into it that as long as you can have faith, then God will give you you prosperity. That's not faith. God, faith is not treating God like a genie in a bottle and saying, hey, I hope you give me this. I hope this comes true. I hope this happens. Great faith is trusting what God does. Great faith is all God's decisions are right, no matter what. We're all going to go through the fire. That's what great faith is. Great faith is trust. Great faith is saying, man, you're my daddy. You're my father. God, you're my father. You gave me that wife. You gave her to me. 
You made me fall in love with her. You allowed me to have her in my life. And now you've taken me, taken her from me. That's up to you, God. It's your choice because you gave her to me. And that's what he's saying. That's what faith is. Trusting God. Trusting in what he does. Man, me and God, we don't always see eye to eye. Okay? We don't. Brother, every time I see them little kids with leukemia and stuff, I don't see eye to eye with God. No. I let me, God, what are you doing? Sometimes I get in a dark place, brother, and I, and, I, and I don't know. And he'll say, I love you. And I love them. And trust me. Trust me. And that's what you got to do as a pastor sometimes. People ask questions and think things and do things. you got to be like, just trust me. I'm serious. And if you get a preacher that you can't trust, go to another church. If you get a preacher that, right. they, you know what I mean, you're thinking he is that way. And I, I've been to those kind of churches. Get out as fast as you can. But I'm just telling you, we got to trust God. He's our daddy. My dad would tell me to do things, Kenny. I remember he would tell me, jump down, I'll catch you. Man, are you nuts? No, jump down. I will catch you. I will not let you fall. That's why I have trouble with Charlotte. I'll say, jump, jump, I'll catch you. And they, they, when they get that time, you, I've seen these kids where you tell them, jump, I'll catch you. And that, they'll jump every time. They're daredevils. They're nuts. They'll, they'll, every time they'll jump to daddy. They got faith. They trust him. He's going to catch me. He's going to catch me. And that's what way we got to be. No matter how bad it hurts, or no matter how much we nothing makes sense, we got to trust him. And we got to jump into his arms and we got to say, He's going to catch me every time. He's already caught me and he's going to take care of me. We're all going to go through fire. The only way that we're going to make it is if we understand and realize that God's right, even if we don't understand it. God's always good, He's always right. The Bible says, and believe me, sometimes we don't see eye to eye, but God's still in control. Okay, even if he decides to answer my prayer in a way that does completely different from the way I thought, he's still in control. My wife Tina, before Miss Dorothy got in church, okay, she she my wife didn't have a great life. She didn't have a bad life, but Miss Dorothy had been married a few times and and uh, been in and out of things and trying to find happiness. And the only way she found true happiness was when she got saved, when she trusted Christ her Savior. That's when she found true happiness. But Tina had lived in different houses and bounced around and had different lives and different things like that. And you know how I met Tina? She lived down the road from me. You know why? Because her mom had gotten a, a, a divorce and they got kicked out of the house, and she was living with her grandpa, okay, and her grandma. And she was living with them. That's how we met. Okay, do you see what I'm saying? See, my wife, at the time, it looked like it was a horrible situation. It, she didn't have the greatest family life. She didn't have a lot of money. She didn't have the greatest clothes out there or anything like that. She was going through a time in her life that was probably not the best she would think. Or maybe it did, it, to most it would look bad. But because of her living down the road from me, we got to meet. I got to fall in love with her. And then she fell in love with me. And then we got to get married. And now, praise God, we got five kids for it. But I'm telling you, at the time when she was going through it, if you would have looked at her life, you'd have said, man, what a wreck. Man, who's got a plan going like this? This is no good. Sometimes we've got to go through the fire. Romans chapter 8, 28, it says this, all things work together for good to them that love God. Okay? That's what it says, right? All things work together for them, the good that love God. Now, people run that down your throat as a Christian all the time. Way, I know you're going through this, but Romans 8.28. Hey, I know you're going through that, Romans 8.28. You know what Romans 8.28 doesn't say? It doesn't say all things will work together for good. It doesn't say when all things will work together for good. It doesn't even say if it's in your lifetime. That's why I preach on you guys about your grandkids. You're affecting your grandkids. That's what I'm saying. You may not see the goodness till the next generation. You may not see the goodness till the generation after that. It doesn't say it's going to, it, it, all things work together for good to them that love God. It's going to happen right now. It doesn't say that you're not going to have a little heartache when that good happens. It doesn't say that you're going to have a ton of money when that goodness happens. It doesn't say that. What it says is all things work together for good. Now, we can wreck our mind and we can try to figure out why and we can ask questions why, but truth be known, our ways are not His ways and our thoughts are not His thoughts and we can't determine what God's thinking and what His plan is. And I'm trying to tell you, maybe He's got a different plan. Paul prayed for healing. He had a thorn in the flesh. His reasons were right. He said, man, God, if you take this thorn out of the flesh, I can win more people to the Lord. I can preach more. I can teach more. I can, I can go farther. I can go to different towns and I can get people saved. He had a good reason to get, to get the thorn out of his flesh. 
Brother Harry thinks it's his eyes. I, I always thought it was a thorn, literally stuck in his flesh. That's where I'm at. But, but what I'm trying to tell you is, is he had an infirmity. He had an ailment. And he had a good reason to have God take it away. But God said no. He said, because if I take that away, then you're going to become proud. And you're going to become, have pride. And, and God says, no, you'll probably do this. You'll be lifted in pride. So Paul, I've kept it that way. And I'm going to give you grace to deal with it. I'm going to allow to deal with it. And Paul says, that's fine by me. And the scripture says, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in mine infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I will take pleasure in the infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecution and distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. What if God takes your biggest request and he answers in a way you're not respecting? Okay, maybe he says, hey, that new job's not right for you. Maybe he says, hey, it's not right if you make that, that ball team. Maybe you're traveling on that ball team and maybe you're going to run with some ruffians. I don't think that's where I want you, so I'm not going to allow you to do that. Maybe uh, you're trying out for cheerleading and he say, man, them girls at the school, they're worldly. I don't want you to be with them girls, so I'm not going to let you have that. Maybe you got a relationship right now and God don't want you in that relationship. I'm not talking about marriage. I'm talking about dating. And maybe God say, hey, I, that's not the one for you. And he'll break it up. He'll break it off. He'll take care of it. God's got a reason. Young person, what if he plan changes your plans for co college? What if he decides you'd rather go, he, he'd rather have you here? Or he'd rather have you there? Or maybe he's calling you to preach. Or maybe he's calling you to the mission field. God has a plan. We don't see it. We don't know what it is. But what if he decides it's better? What if he decides that it's better that you're not healed? What if he decides that? What if he says, you know, you got cancer, but I don't think I'm going to heal you. I think it'd be better if you're not healed. What if he decides that? Is he still a good God? My Bible says he is. Is he still right? He's always right. He's never wrong. If he's wrong, then our salvation is worthless. If he's wrong, then us being saved is worthless. We can't hang our hat on nothing. His book is a fake. He's a liar. If, that's, if he's not true, if he's not who he says he is, he is who he says he is. He's always right. Okay? There's peace in the valley. Okay? When I, when, when, when I think about when I lost dad... There's peace in that valley, okay? When I, when I was in my closet, literally, on my knees, weeping when my dad died, that was the best place I could be. And unless you've been broken, it's hard to explain. But when you're broken and when all you can do is count on God, I know it hurts. <laughs> and I know it's driving you crazy. And I know you can't stand it. But I'm telling you, that is the absolute best place where you can be. Is right down there where He can use you. Right down there. You ever notice, I'd rather preach, uh, I'd rather preach, I, I, I've heard preachers say this, they'll say, I'd rather preach, preach a funeral than preach ten weddings. And I'll tell you why. Because when people are broken, what do they need? They need help. They need somebody. When we're broken, what do we need? We need God. That's when we're closest to Him, man. That's when we just want to grab on. We don't care what color your skin is. We don't care if you've offended us. We don't care if you've made us mad. We don't care about any of that. All we care about is we just need you, Jesus. We don't care about anything. We don't care about your plan or none of that stuff. And that's the best place you can be is when you're broken. That's when God can use you. And man, I've had some bad times where I was broken, but then were some of the sweetest times that I've ever had in my Christian life. I'm telling you right now, because that's when I can feel them the most. That's when I want to feel them the most is when I'm hurting and when they're those things. Are you still going to trust Him? Are you still going to believe He's right? Are you still going to believe He's a good Father? What happens the minute, I'll tell you, you know what happens the minute when you get into the storm, this is what happens. Seriously, man, every time. The devil hops on your shoulder, and that's what he says. You know, if he really loved you, he wouldn't take your daddy. You know, if he really loved you, he wouldn't have your house being in foreclosure right now. That's what the devil does. He hops on your shoulder. Man, if he really loved you, he would have given you that promotion at work. He would have allowed you to, to find that woman of your dreams or that man of your dreams. Or, all this would have worked out if he really would have loved you. He's lying to you, okay? The devil's lying to you when he says that. Don't you dare give him an audience. Don't you listen to him. And that's what's happening to John right here. He's down in that basement of that prison. That's what he's saying. And I'm telling you right now, God does love you. God does know your name. He does know everything that you're going through and goes through in your life. He knows your name. 
He knows what he's doing. Number two, what do you do when your faith gets interrupted? There's no reason. There's no explanation. Maybe you're seeing a, a child uh, uh, go astray. Maybe you're seeing your parents contemplating divorce. Maybe you're seeing your father or your mother. They're getting sicker and sicker and sicker in front of your eyes. Maybe you're seeing a hero that fell off a pedestal. That'll interrupt your faith. Someone you thought in the, in the ministry, you thought they were, they were a good godly man or a good godly woman, and they fall, and that'll interrupt your faith. That'll put a little blip there. That'll put something like it. Losing your job. Maybe a death. That'll interrupt your faith. You find yourself not knowing what you believe, not knowing what you know. Have you ever noticed that problems come? They come all at once. You ever notice that? Seriously, when I was a senior in high school, I cut my finger in woodshop. This was in like three months, maybe four months. I cut my finger in woodshop, cut it to the bone, had to wear the stupid cast around my whole senior year. Uh, uh, I wrecked my car. I, uh, I, I later, my, my, me and Miss Tina, we, we split up for a while. I mean, I just one thing after another. It's like they all happen. It's like, it's like you'll have somebody pass away, and then great, the water heater ain't working. Or great, the tire's flat. Or great, this happens. That's the way it works. Problems always come like that. They come in seasons, though. Remember that. They come in seasons. We get summer, it bakes us out. We get fall, it cools back down. We love it. And then we get winter. Winter doesn't stay forever. Fall doesn't stay forever. Spring doesn't stay forever. It goes in seasons. And that's what's happened. The perfect, you know what we find out? We find out that the perfect will of God ain't so perfect. That's what we find out. We think, well, hey, I'm, I'm coming to church. I'm reading my Bible. I'm praying. I got saved. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to get baptized. I, I got baptized. And man, that's the perfect will of God. And then we find out, hey, it ain't so perfect. Like these people are, some people are mean still. Some situations are not perfect. The perfect will of God isn't always perfect. Remember that. Okay, if it was perfect, then everybody would be a Christian. If it was perfect, you wouldn't see people dropping out. You wouldn't see people quitting, giving up. It'd be perfect. Why would they leave? It's not perfect. The perfect will of God is not perfect. Peter quit after the Lord came back. You understand that? He said, I go a fishing. He quit after the Lord came back. The Lord died. Lord came back. Lord came back again. Reappeared. Showed himself twice. And then he quit. You want to know why he quit? He was hurt, man. He thought Jesus was coming back and he thought Jesus was going to take hold and Jesus was going to be the conquering Messiah. And it hurt his feelings. He said, man, I'm not trusting you anymore. I'm not believing you anymore. He didn't believe that Jesus was who he said he was. When Lazarus died, Lazarus was in the grave four days before Jesus raised him up. Okay? Jesus was super close. Like if you looked on a map and you GPSed it, he was so close to Mary and Martha. He could have been there in no time, but he decided not to. Now you talk about hurt feelings. You think John was hurt. There's Mary and Martha. Uh, Mary, one, of them was, one of them was so hurt, she didn't even come out of the house and see Jesus. These people loved Jesus. They were his friends. She was so hurt at Jesus for not healing her brother. She didn't even come out of the house. She didn't even talk to him. She talked to him later. But all they said was, God, you, Jesus, you were here. We have saw you heal people. We've seen you take care of others. Why didn't you come for us? Why didn't you come and heal our brother? Why didn't you come and heal Lazarus? He's been in the grave four days. Why didn't you come? You could have came, but you didn't. Because it wasn't in his plan. And his plan was to do something greater. They were so hurt when their brother got sick. But God had a plan. Once, once, it was, once they saw the plan, they got to see the miracle. Now when you're in the midst of it, it's going to be hard to cope with this interrupted faith. You're not going to believe what's going on. It's going to be the hardest thing you've ever been through. I can't believe how hard things are. You won't even want to get up in the morning. You won't even want to go to work in the morning. You'll be lacking sleep. You'll be doing all these things. But after you see a miracle, after you see God's plan, and hopefully we get to in this lifetime, but when you see God's plan, you'll be like, man, that was worth it all. Man, Man, I'm so God. glad that happened. And I think that when we get to heaven, we'll be like, man, I wish I would have been just a little bit more faithful. I think we'll grieve and we'll be like, man, God, I'm sorry. You had such a big plan. I'm so stupid. I didn't listen to you. But I'm telling you right now, when you're going through the storm, it ain't like that. When you're going through the storm, it don't feel like that. When you're going through the storm, it hurts. When you're going through the storm, you don't... You, you, you. The week I went back to work after Dad died, it's like you're walking in concrete. You're trying to do your job, and you're just like this. Yeah. And I noticed this. I noticed, you know what it had made me? It, it softened my heart so much that even the guys that worked that were jerks, I sat and talked to them. Even the guys that I usually couldn't stand, I just sat and talked to them. Because all of a sudden, it seemed, everything else seemed small. All those little things they had said, all those things my boss had done wrong, it just seemed small in the big picture of it all. 
It seemed like, you know what, I'm going to sit here and listen to this guy. He's, he's a man. He's a human being. He's got kids. He's got a wife. He's got family. And that's what God will do. And God can use you then. God can use us, and that's what He does. What if God's answer is no? That's the last thing. What if God's answer is no? Man, preacher, you are not helping me. Seriously, I came here to get help, and you're not helping me. I just want to show you something. Turn in your Bibles. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Turn to Luke chapter 7, verse number 20. I want, let me be your, if you let me be your pastor this morning, I, I, this helped me. This helped me several times. I didn't even use this when Dad died. I mean, I just, it just this helped me at another time in my life, but I could have, and I, I don't know why I didn't. Math, Luke chapter 7, verse 20. Now, this is another account of this same story. This is, this is another account of the same story, okay? Luke chapter 7, verse 20. Re, look at this. Everybody there. When the men were coming to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? And in that same hour he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and evil spirits and said unto them that were blind, and he gave sight. And Jesus, here's Jesus talking. They said, hey, John sent us two guys. It's, it's me. It's me, Bill and John. Or Bill and Ron, whoever. God, John sent us. We're his disciples. I don't even know who they were. I'll have to study and see. But, God, but, but John sent us, Jesus, and he wants to know, are you really who you say you are? Are you the one? He's in prison. He just wants to know. All he wants to know is, are you who you say you are, Jesus? And here's what he said. Go your way and tell John what things ye have seen and heard. How that, number one, look at my, look, read this, but listen to me as I'm talking. Number one, how the blind see, that's one. How the lame walk, that's two. How the lepers are cleansed, that's three. How the deaf hear, four. The dead are raised, five. And to the poor, the gospel is preached. That's six. Now, that's a messianic prophecy. Okay, in, 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 in Isaiah, they prophesied when Jesus came. They said, this is what I'm going to do. Okay, Jesus is coming, and this is what he's going to do. He's going to, and it's word for word. If you look in Isaiah, if you read Isaiah, it says that he's going to, hey, he's going to, the blind are going to see, the lame are going to walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor, the gospel is preached. Now, how many did you count? You counted six. Okay, here's the problem. There's seven messianic prophecies. Okay, he left one out when he was talking to John. All right, he left, he gave John his answer. Okay, he gave John his answer. John has been preaching this book before Jesus came around. He was the forerunner. He knows what it says in Isaiah. They didn't have the, old, the New Testament. All they had was the Old. So he's been preaching the Old Testament Bible for all this time. And he's been telling them what Jesus is going to do. Jesus is going to do seven things. Okay, and he told them what he's going to do. And look what he did at the time. And then he... And then he sneaks in a beatitude. And not that he's sneaky, but man, God's so good. And here's what he does. And blessed is he that whosoever shall not be offended in me. He sneaks in a beatitude. He leaves something out. He's telling him, don't get offended. Don't let this be a stumbling block to you. That's what he's trying to tell us. If this kind of stuff happens don't, in your life, I've got a plan. Don't let it be a stumbling block. Now, if you turn, and you, I don't want you to turn there. I want you to write it down. Think about it. Look at it later. But I, I, I'll turn to it. Isaiah 42.7. He gave John the answer. He, man, he's so good. He's so good. And this is all John wanted. John just wanted the answer. Isaiah 42, 7. To open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. He left that out. He gave John his answer by leaving it out. He didn't tell, he, he's basically telling John, you're not getting out of prison. You're not getting out of jail. It's not my plan. He prophesied all, all six of those things. And number seven, that the prisoners were going to be released. And he basically left that one out. And he's telling John, you're not getting out of jail. And it's not in my plan. That was his message that he sent to John. And after John had went through all that darkness, and all that reality, and all that trouble, and all his foundations had been shook, finally he got the answer that he wanted. And what did it do? It stilled his doubt. It made his doubt. It settled his doubt. It, 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 it settled John's doubt. John's doubt was settled. You understand? That's the hardest part. The hardest part is not knowing. The hardest part is not seeing the plan. Yeah. And that's what he did. He settled his doubt. He settled John's doubt. So John said, okay, this is what you're going to do. I see how it's going to go. I know you love me. I know you're right. And I'm going to trust you. 
And you just told me I'm not getting out of prison, so I'm going to sit here, and I'm going to be happy, and I'm going to trust you no matter what. And that's what he did, and that's what John did. And I don't want you to think that John died a sissy's death. I mean, John died a manly death. He was a stud. He was a hard, tough preacher. He wasn't a wussy. But I'm just telling you right now that, that once he found out, and once his doubt was stilled, and once his doubt, his doubt was settled, he said, okay, that's all I needed to know. I'm fine. I'm fine with that. So what do you, how do you make it? How do you make it through these things? Do what John did. John went right to Jesus. That's the first thing he did. He just went right to the source. He said, I'm not asking any self-help book. I'm not going to ask my mama. I'm not going to ask my daddy. I'm going right to Jesus. And that's what you need to do. When you're going through, go right to Jesus. Don't run away from him. Don't run away from him no matter how hard it hurts or how bad it hurts or how bitter you are. Run towards him. Number two, ask him to bend your will to his. Maybe he's got a plan. Have him give you grace. Have him give you comfort. Say, God, let me accept it. Even though, help my unbelief. Even though I don't think this is the right plan. Show me. Show me that this is the right plan. Show me that you're in this. I'm begging you, God, show me something. Just show me that you're in this and I'll trust you. But you can't do that if you don't ask him. You can't do that if you don't go to him. If you run from him, you can't do that. Number three, realize that, that bad in our lives sometimes is better. David said, it's better for me. I needed it. You ever do that? You ever have your dad whoop you and say, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you? It never works that way. It always hurted me more than it hurts him. Okay? But you've got to remember that. It hurts God to hurt us. God hurts for us. The Bible said in, 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 uh, when, it, when it talked about, uh, oh man, Jesus wept when Lazarus died. Jesus hurt, man. Jesus walked up and seen all these people hurting. He hurt. He sees what you're going through. He hurts for you. He hurts with you. you got to understand, the whole Bible is like a paradox. It, it don't make sense. A paradox is conflicting expectations. Every Bible principle goes against popular opinion. You know what? That's the problem. We've got to have something logically that makes sense. Listen to this. According to the Bible, in order to have life, what do we got to do? We've got to die. In order to, uh, to wear a crown, we've got to bear a cross. In, 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 court, in order to, to be exalted, we've got to humble ourselves. It's just the opposite of what we think it is. Okay? Just, the just shall live by faith, the Bible says. You know, when you look at people's tombstones, here, here maybe the, the, this helped me. This season that we're going through, this season of trouble, how do we judge people? We judge them by their tombstone. I think my dad says 1946 to 2015. Okay? One day here, one day here. What's the middle? That little dash. Okay? That little dash is all you got. All right? That little dash is all the crying that you got to do. When we get to heaven, there's not going to be no more crying. There's not going to be no more tears. There's not going to be no more sorrow. There's not going to be any more pain. All we got is that little dash. All we got is that little dash to prove to God how much we love Him by staying away from sin. See, everybody thinks that I'm a mean preacher and I want you to stay away from sin. You understand what, what, what staying away from sin does? That just proves to God that you love Him. That's You're right. just showing it. That's what I did to my mom and dad. I showed them how much I love them by not doing stuff that I wasn't supposed to. I, didn't, I wanted to do that stuff. I wanted to have fun like everybody else and do those things in life and, and do all those bad things. But I love my mom and dad too much. I didn't want to hurt them. I knew it'd kill my mom if she ever found out some of the things I did. It'd kill my dad if he found out I'd done this. What do you think he does to God? That's why you're proving that you love We just got that little dash on that tombstone. That's all we got. It's just a little bit of time that you're going to have to cry. It's just a little bit of time that you're going to be weary and sad. It's a little bit of time that you're not, things ain't going to make sense. It's also a little bit of time that you got to get other people saved. Just a little bit of time to get out there and soul win. That's all you got, man. And seriously, Harry, if I look at my tombstone, I think if, if that dot, if we could change that dash, if we could change that into everybody knows computers and downloads, if we could change that into that bar, that status yeah. bar, mine's right over here. Yeah. I ain't got much time. I'm almost fully downloaded, Oliver. I'm almost all the way to the end. You know what I mean? So we got to get busy. But just remember, those of you that are suffering, that also goes for you. You've only got a little more time. You've only got that much more time to cry and that much more time to suffer. Get to Christ. Beg Him. This altar is always open. Amen. There's something about coming to an old-fashioned altar and talking to God. And I ain't saying this is a sacred place. I'm not saying that I shouldn't be wearing shoes or I shouldn't be spitting and sputtering on it. But I'm just telling you, this is one place I guarantee that you can come and you can meet with God and you can talk to Him. 
and he'll hear you. And the cool thing is he hears you wherever you're at, but, but it just seems like to me an old-fashioned altar is a place where I can come and talk to him, and I can tell him what's going on in my life, and he'll help me. Let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity, Lord. And